put the pen behind your <laughs> ear and make yourself a steer. <clears throat> it was smart night tonight and uh What's wrong with this? Oh, it's not smart, is it? Yeah, but you're the, we all were sitting there wearing a suit, sweating to Yes, I am cooking. Oh, I'm just wearing a t-shirt. I've actually cooled down a bit since... Did you open the window? Yeah. Hello, and welcome back once again to War Mysteries. I'm joined, as always, by Matt. Oh. And I'm Jay. Uh, this time round, we're looking at the mystery of a disappearance of a woman who vanished somewhere in the early 1940s, only for her to be discovered a year or two later on inside a tree. April 18th of 1943, World War II was at its height in Europe. Uh, the Katyn massacre had recently been discovered. Uh, RAF raids on Stuttgart were underway. And Hitler had recently met with Mussolini in Salzburg to discuss problems on the Mediterranean fronts. In the UK, however, life was somewhat quieter. Uh, everyday household items were in short supply, and so four young boys set out into Hagley Wood in Worcestershire to poach for bird eggs. Coming across a young witch hazel, a tree that the boys thought would be a particularly good spot to search for bird's nests, one of the boys climbed into it. Instead of a nest, however, he discovered something sinister. A human skull. This is the dark tale of Bella in the Witch Elm. Bella in the Witch Elm, do you know anything about this one? No, other than what you just said. I've wanted to do this one for a long time. I was, gonna, I was tempted to try and undertake this one in series one, but I didn't think we had quite the footing. Is it, it's World War Two, is it? It's World War Two, And it's mysterious. Oh, it's, it's, the mysteries are just spewing out of its pores. Good, that's the main <clears> And it's still unsolved. So, there's the tree they found her in. To start with, obviously. The usual spot for pictures, my, just just me. So we'll just, they'll just be seeing you right now looking at that picture. It's actually a photo. Mm -hmm. Well, you seem surprised every time I do this. When did you take that? I didn't. <clears throat> Who took that? In? I've got a clue. <laughs> Somebody in the nineteen forties. I colourised it. Snappy snaps. No. So that's the tree they found her in. Snappy snaps. Yes, that's a, that is a witch hazel, not a witch elm. Do we know if it's still there oh. now? No, they had to cut the tree down to get her out. So you didn't go back to look at it? I didn't. <clears throat> I was going to. Um, I haven't got a pencil anymore. Why are you wearing a suit? A proper suit? Well, I've got a blazer on, but why are you wearing a complete three-piece? I, uh, I do the weather for a cable channel. I was doing it before I came here. What, here? No, next door. It's just Ivan next door. Yeah, we do the weather. We call him Crazy Ivan. So it is... Oh, it's located in that woodland. That's the Hagley Wood Road. Um, not a very good picture of the area. Somebody sprayed Hagley Wood on the floor there. Vandals. Oh, Google Maps. Oh, right, Hagley Wood. Did you say in Lincolnshire? <clears throat> Worcestershire. Worcestershire. Yeah. Um, specifically uh, Stourbridge. Oh. Or near Stourbridge. Just south of Birmingham. Alright. <clears throat> okay. So essentially the broad strokes are four lads, four young lads, went into Hagley Wood looking for bird eggs, looking around for a bit of cheap dinner. One of them climbs up into a tree, reaches down in, sees something white, Picks it up. It's not an egg. It's a skull. What well, do you think it was? An ostrich egg? <laughs> oh, no! He's a kid, isn't he? Poor kid. I imagine it would be quite traumatic. Well, it was like eight, nine. Pulled it out. Shat himself. Right? As you would. On um, some old kid's estate. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, the guy's probably in his elder years. He's not got time to be running around after kids. He's going to be running anyway. So they were trespassing wherever. Hagley Wood. Yeah. And they found, they were looking for eggs and they found 
a skull. Mm -hmm. Are they human? Let's find out. Wartime was a period of austerity and rationing in the 1940s, and so poaching, trading, and other means of acquiring extra food and supplies flourished. Outside of the large cities, life in the countryside naturally afforded more opportunities to keep the larder stocked during the most difficult times. Wartime restrictions no doubt were a key influence in the decision of four young boys, Tom Willits, Robert Farmer, Robert Hart and Fred Payne, to make a jaunt into Hagley Wood that spring day in search of an extra meal. The heavily wooded area itself forms part of the Hagley House estate, which to this day is private land, belonging at the time to Lord Cobham. It sits near Witchbury Hill in Stourbridge, Worcestershire. The boys naturally expected to find a bird nest among the branches of the hollow witch hazel tree. But upon discovering a bleach white object instead, Bob Farmer decided to inspect further, thinking they perhaps were the bones of an animal. They were not. Bob identified human teeth and a tuft of matted hair still attached to a small patch of rotting skin on the side of the cheekbone, and the boys realised that they had found a human skull. Uh, replacing the grizzly find into the tree uh, using a stick that had some taffeta bound around it. Well, taffeta's like a, like a cloth. So they wrapped it around a stick, shoved it in the mouth of this skull, in the jaw, between teeth, and then just pushed it back down into the tree and left a stick in there. Once they come across the realisation that they'd found a body and that they were trespassing, they agreed not to inform anybody of their discovery. Oh, they, yeah. They were poaching for eggs, weren't they? Or, or swindling for eggs, they couldn't tell anybody. Yeah, right. so they couldn't really go back home and be like, um, just out trespassing today, uh, found a body. That's a civil matter though, isn't it? <clears throat> well, it is now. I don't, I don't know if it was different back then. You probably didn't get shot. The youngest of the boys, however, was not comfortable with keeping the secret from his parents and told his father what they had found that day when they all returned home later. Local police attended the site the following morning and upon retrieving the skull, made the further discovery of a human skeleton, complete save for one hand. It became clear in time that they had found the body of a woman. I don't know that. Hip bones, is that analysis of the shape of the bones, the yeah. length of the bones. That's got less ribs or something as well, or more ribs. Don't I, I don't know. Smart, yeah. Smart. They must have figured it out somehow. Maybe the jawbone shape or the spine or... Maybe someone in the comments can... <clears throat> I think later on we find us. out that they actually analysed the pelvis and she, they realised she'd given birth at some point in her life. Right. Which obviously a man couldn't do. Unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was deduced that the body must have been placed in the tree either shortly after her death, or more chillingly, while she was still alive. As once rigor mortis had set in, the body would not have been able to have been positioned into the confines of the hollow tree. The tree itself had to be destroyed in order to remove the remains, so tightly packed in were the bones. Examination of the body commenced at the West Midlands Forensic Science Laboratory at Birmingham University, by Professor James Webster, where several conclusions were drawn. She was deemed to have been around 35 years of age, five feet tall and with mousy brown hair. She had irregular teeth in the lower jaw and there was evidence of previous dentistry. It was also determined that she had given birth at least once in her life. Your age. Right. Yep. Middle age. She had irregular teeth in the lower jaw, and there was evidence of previous dentistry. But they didn't work on her. Well, like a crown. Uh, I didn't. I didn't find out what they'd actually. Um, I, I just know that they examined her teeth, and uh, I suppose a mortician or a dentist, dentist or whatever. Yeah, you know, someone who analyzes bodies um, would have seen that she had worked on by knowing what 
the shape the teeth should be as compared to what they were, I guess. Buck jaw, I suppose. Death had occurred approximately 18 months before she was discovered, which would have been sometime around October of 1941. She just decomposed pretty quickly then. Do you decompose that quick? I guess you do. I, don't, I, I remember reading somewhere that, I think in, in modern times, so 2000s onwards, takes the, the body about five or six weeks to fully decompose. But 200 years ago, it would happen in two days. Why? Preservatives and the food. Oh yeah. I can see somebody challenging that in the comments. Let us know if you know how long it takes a body to decompose nowadays versus 1940s. Um, we'd be interested to hear. Yeah. And be calm about it. Be calm about it. There were three prevailing theories that surround that case. All drawing evidence from different aspects of the discovery. None have been proven beyond reasonable doubt. So your favourite bit now. We get into the lovely juicy theory bits. The he loves them. He loves them. And the best bit. You can get rid of that. Okay. And now we move on to the theories. Oh, we're we doing... Okay. Are we doing that? I thought that's what you said. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, what's it? Red, are you on the red stripe? Yeah, I'm not normally a massive fan of red stripe because it's got sugar and crap in it. I prefer a bud. Okay. But um, maybe they'll let us advertise or something. What's they? his name down the shop? Didn't have any bud. I know he bought Hill. John. I don't know what his name is. Oh, do I? Uh, okay, so the first of our theories is that this was a ritual killing. Initial investigation of the area revealed what appeared to be a sinister aspect to the mystery, when the severed hand of the woman was found several metres, or 13 paces, from the tree in which she was entombed. Later in the investigation, it was discovered that the severing of the hand may indicate that the killing was ritualistic in nature, thought to be representative of the Hand of Glory. Witchcraft had certainly had its heyday by the early 1940s, but was not entirely out of practice in wartime Britain, and the theory that the woman in the tree had been murdered by a coven, or a cult, was put forward, with the aforementioned Hand of Glory offered as evidence by Margaret Murray of University College London. Margaret Murray. She did a lot of work on ancient Egypt and symbology and so on. Right. Um, I think she was also one of the founding um, members of the Wicca movement. Oh, she's just lost all my respect. Not baskets. The, Not, I know, you know. Yeah. Baskets are otherwise. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> you ever heard of The Hand of Glory? I've seen a film called The Hand of Glory, but... Um, have you? <laughs> yeah. What's that about then? Actually, no, don't tell me. I won't tell you. <clears throat> I've not heard of The Hand of Glory, no. Okay. Other than the one that Jenna Jameson's in. I have a picture of that hand. I've seen that somewhere else before. Leathery. You Wasn't that in the, in the Mummy, the film The Mummy with... I've seen that somewhere. I think I Is that the actual hand? Yeah. Why is it so distended and long? What the cut right. hand off for? Well, it's bone, isn't it? It's decomposing. There's the ball or the wrist, isn't it? Thumb. Right hand. Yeah, but look at the distance between the tip of her thumb and the tip of her index finger. It's ridiculous. No wonder they cut it off. <sighs> All right. Where, where, they, where is that then? Well, Why that, have you got a picture gone, of that? Gone. Disappeared. Gone. Nobody knows where it is? No. Do you know? No. No, 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 no. So... That's horrible. Yeah, it's grim. But it will become significant in a moment. The Hand of Glory itself was, according to old beliefs that originated in medieval Europe, a powerful artefact which was created in the following way. Take the right or left hand of a felon who is hanging from a gibbet beside a highway. Wrap it in part of a funeral pall and so wrapped, squeeze it well. Put this into an earthenware vessel with zimat, nitre, salt and long peppers, the whole well powdered. Leave it in this vessel for a fortnight, then take it out, 
and expose it to the full sunlight during the dark days until it becomes quite dry. If the sun isn't strong enough, put it in an oven with fur in a vein. Next, make a kind of candle from the fat of a gibbeted felon, virgin wax, sesame and peony, and use the hand of glory as a candlestick to hold this candle when lighted. Though it's in every place into which you go with this painful instrument, it shall remain motionless. Murray was the first to draw attention to the separated hand as being representative of the Hand of Glory. It was to be acquired at night, and could supposedly be used to ward off evil spirits, detect nearby treasure, or inflict paralysis upon others. She also drew attention to the ancient tradition, in how a dead witch could be imprisoned in a hollow tree to prevent her spirit from causing harm in the afterlife. Indeed, there had been rumours of other unsolved disappearances and deaths in the region in the months since. Though these were thought to be gypsy killings, a practice that was actually very rare among gypsy circles. No further evidence beyond conjecture, however, was ever uncovered. It was to be acquired at night, and could supposedly be used to ward off evil spirits, detect nearby treasure, or inflict paralysis upon others. Could have done with that for the Nazi gold. <laughs> I was going to say, someone's been playing too much D&D, &D, haven't they, really? Maybe. By the sound of that. Maybe. That's a magic item. Isn't it? What are the dog days? Uh, the do you know, the, the, the dog days of summer. What are they? The period between early July and early September when the hot, sultry weather of summer usually occurs in the Northern Hemisphere of any given year. Summer. Hmm. Except that. I'll be getting married on a dog day then. Okay, so that is so basically more of the ritual. That's it. That's it. Es essentially, don't try this at home. Don't do it at home. Yeah. Wait. I don't know where you get a felon from that's hanging from a gibbet, but beyond that, don't do it at home. So we just got the hand to go. on. I don't think the hand is proof of the ritual. They might well, just it, fell that, off. To me, that well, yeah, maybe. When you they know, were moving her. People have said perhaps it was a fox or a, um, a scavenger. But it has to be a pretty selective scavenger to just go for a hand. So the thing is here, right? If the hand and this D and D ritual, <laughs> then she'd have had to have been dead when they put her in the tree. Why? Because otherwise, it's just sick. <laughs> it's witchcraft, isn't it? That's the whole point. So how do they get the hand in that condition? You're saying the hand was... Well, if they've done, if they've followed this ritual, does that, that looks like it's been baked in the sun to me. It does, yeah. It looks like... Really leathery. Really old German tourists in Greece. <sighs> okay, so that's theory right. one. So, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I mean, neither, neither am I, truth be told, but... It all hinges on the hand. And all this hurrah about putting a pony in an oven <laughs> in the... Dog days, is it? Yeah. It just seems that July. seems a bit, a bit, bit loose. Have you yeah. got a better theory? Well, yes, I have. Let's go on to theory number two, which is that it was an accidental death. The theory that the woman in the tree died accidentally begins with the testimony of a woman named Una Mossop in the early 1950s. She made a statement to police that her ex-husband, Jack Mossop, was responsible. Jack Mossop was employed by the AST, or Air Work Services Training, and later the Armstrong Sidley Works and Standard Aero, both situated in Coventry. There were eyewitness accounts of Jack being seen wearing RAF uniforms around town despite not being a member of the Air Force. He had married Una in the 1930s. According to Una, Jack Mossop and a Dutch man called Van Rolt had gone out drinking in the local town of Stourbridge sometime in late 1941. They had kept company that night with a woman who had become very intoxicated as the evening progressed. As Una stated, she had become awkward. In an apparent attempt to teach her a lesson, the two men had walked her into Hagley Wood and placed her into the now infamous Witch Elm, thinking the experience of waking inside a tree in the middle of the woods might change her ways. She must have been absolutely hammered. Yeah. All right. 
Um, so so they man- put her in the tree. They'd manoeuvred her into this tree. Upside down. Uh, yeah, pretty much. And just left her there overnight. Where'd they get the stepladder from? Because you're going to need it, aren't you? Well, you know, that tree's not very big. Probably it's just massive. Probably just, ye- <laughs> probably just yeeted her into it or something, you know. Give her a boost. All right. They've been drinking, they've found a way. Yeah, he's not sounding very good. I'm, I'm starting to prefer the hand. <laughs> Leathery. If this story is to be believed, this woman evidently must have died overnight, possibly of exposure to the elements. Jack Mossop was allegedly institutionalised shortly after, plagued by nightmares of a woman staring at him in the dark from inside a tree. He died in 1942 in that same institution, and with only Una's testimony over a decade later, this story has never been confirmed beyond doubt. The identity of the woman in the tree, at least as far as relates to this theory, is not known, but is alluded to passively that she may have been a sex worker. All right. So, essentially, nothing really to do with the war, for the most part, but again, we'll dig into that in a minute because the next theory kind of links in with that a bit. Um, but essentially, a sex worker who got pissed and they put her in a tree and she died and they didn't tell anybody. And then the guy went mental and died in a uh, mental asylum. Pushing it a bit, uh, yeah, I think. A, bit, uh, a little bit. That's probably, that sounds like the sort of half assed excuse I'd come up with if I come home at 3 a.m. Did his wife leave him when he went to the Yes, yeah, she did. She divorced him, yeah. Because he. Had sex with a woman. Well, I read in, around, in and around AST, Air Work Services Training. They loaned load him a car, a standard, a standard car, um, which is one of the, you know, officers had him. All right. Um, so he uh, would go and disappear in his car for days on end. And... What about the bloke that was with him? Van Rolt. Never found him. Where did he go? We'll find out in a bit. It wasn't a happy marriage, apparently. Do you have any kids? Uh, yeah, apparently there was a lad called Julian Mossop, who at one point turned up as a suspect. Okay, how um, old was he at the time? It's getting too deep. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. Deep. I don't know about this. This this one. It's. I'm not convinced myself. Third one better be good. All right. Well, the third theory, which is really why we're here, is that this woman was a member of a Nazi spy ring. Final theory, tying in subtle ways with Una Mossop's testimony, is that the woman found in the tree was Clarabella Dronkers. During September of 1940, Operation Sea Lion had been planned as a seaborne invasion of Great Britain by Nazi Germany, and in order to prepare the landing forces, accurate intelligence of British defences would be required. A German spy by the name of Franz Rathgeb allegedly had more to say on this. When interviewed later in life by an author, he claimed that an agent of the Nazi spy network, the Abwehr 3, by the name of Clara, was operating in the area of Hagley Wood near Stourbridge, shortly before the body was found in the tree, and she had had extensive knowledge of the Midlands area, having parachuted into the region in 1940. Which is not an unknown tactic, because people did do that. Uh, pr- yeah, well, you know, perhaps not from a Junkers 52, but from th- that exact plane. <laughs> uh, Clara, or according to... Italery. Yeah, I'm not moving very quickly. It's stiff, it? bit stiff. I know, you don't. You get annoyed when I do this, don't you? Well, it doesn't make any sense, does it? They're out of reach of anyone. If they're going to go and start that, they need to... We'll have to get a ladder then, won't they? What, next to a propeller? Just put it in front and go yeah. and then fall into it and slice your face off. Nope. Clara, or according to this theory, Clarabella Drunkers, is said to have been a Dutch, or according to some sources, half Dutch, half German spy, operating in association with a number of others and was tasked with locating munitions and airframe factories. In a strange twist, 
Clarabella is thought to have either been wounded or killed, and her body placed in the tree by a British officer and a foreign trapeze artist, said to be Mossop and Van Rolt, which implicates them both in collusion with the German Secret Service. Would you say she was half Dutch, half German? She was either half Dutch, half German, or all Dutch, native Dutch. Um, one of the people that she was known to associate with in this theory was from Java, which was a Dutch colony at the time. Why Why a foreign trapeze artist? Why, why? Could you, well, I don't know. It could have just been his cover. There was, there was uh, some flavour text along with this article that I read that said that Van Rolt went by the name of Frack... Uh, and he performed in the Coventry Hippodrome or something like that. It was like a like a cabaret nightclub. Yeah, nothing to do with hippos. Yeah, oh yeah, no, nothing to do with hippos. But that's just that's just what the names were like back then, I suppose. But if he was a trapeze artist, that would fit. Or if that was his cover. Uh, the addition of a letter from Una Mossop and its tying together of known associates uh, independently lends it some weight. I've got that letter. So, what, the original? No, well, no, obviously not. I've got a copy of it that you can never read from. Did you go and... No, you wouldn't have done. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You didn't go and get it and photocopy it, you... I went Googled to the National it. Archives. You did? No, I didn't go to the National no. Archives, no. But there's... Well, that's the whole letter there. Oh. So, you, you can look at that and try... You expect me to be able to read that? Well, yeah, it's exactly what I said when I looked at it. So, I've, luckily for you, I've translated it. Why don't you give me that one then? Because that's what the letter. They, you know, you need to see this. It's my handwriting. Can't even get one word out of it. Um, it took me. I had to translate this from that. So, think about how long that took me to do. Does that says leaving there, doesn't it? No. Having to use that says. Oh yeah. Much as I hate having to use a nom de plume. How did people read anything back then? This is the 50s. We weren't eating properly, were they? That's a nightmare. I'm glad that I don't have to do any research for these things. Uh, All I have to do is buy the beer. So she wrote this letter to a journalist in 1953 who went by the name of Quester. It was like an alias. <clears throat> Dear Quester, finish your articles for the Witch Elm crime by all means. They are interesting to your readers but you will never solve the mystery. The one person who could give the answer is now beyond the jurisdiction of earthly courts. The affair is closed and involves no witches, black magic, nor moonlight rites. That isn't even close to the word nor. <laughs> That's a joke. Can we possibly zoom in, can we zoom in on that for the viewers? It just looks like someone's run out of ink. <laughs> I, look, I, I honestly thought it was written in a different language. Much as I have, hate having to use a nom de plume, I think you would appreciate if you knew me. Okay. The, the only clues I can give you are that the person responsible for the crime died insane in 1942, and the victim was Dutch and arrived illegally in England around 1941. I have no wish to recall any more. The bit below mentions a friend, but apparently has absolutely nothing to do with what she's talking about. Why well, they scribbled it out? That's, she did it. Oh. Then so so and said all that, and then, Anna. and then went on to say, an arty Jean had a fantastic time in Blackpool and brought us back a nice snow dome with the Blackpool Tower in it. It may as well do for all the relevance it's got, yeah. All right. So that's what she said in her letter. That letter went to the papers. There was a response or two and then it all kind of died off. The only reason that we know, or potentially know, that she is called Bella was because of some graffiti. I was going to ask that, because she hasn't been necessarily called that so far. At first, it didn't appear. That's, that, that is the, the spire, which is on Witchbury Hill, really close to Hagley Wood. Mm -hmm. But it actually appeared on, a, on a, an alleyway wall in Birmingham first. It said, who put Lou Bella down the witch elm? And it started spreading across the country. So the only reason that we've got a name, Bella, is because of that graffiti. Just because of some teenage graffiti eyes. So there's no way of actually knowing if it's anything to do with her or not. So Bella's but not it's a, name. a little bit too 
on the nose, really, isn't it? You know, who put Bella in the witch elm? Right. So that's why we call it Bella. And it ties in quite neatly with the fact that it may be Clarabella Drunkers. Yeah, I suppose it does. So that's pretty much it. Um, there have there's been facial reconstruction done on the on photographs of the skull that were found, so I can show you that. That is what she was supposed to have looked like, which obviously we'll show for our viewers. That was a, a that was done by a facial reconstructive expert when uh, two thousand and eighteen. How on earth do they know that? There must be some science behind it. Yeah, yeah, they, you know, they used uh, fracture analysis, they had photos of the bones. The bones themselves have gone. So no one knows where, they disappeared sometime between the 50s and now. Quite haunting that, actually. Well, the hope was that if they reconstructed her face, somebody somewhere in the world would have a photo in an album somewhere that will look like her. Or it will jog some memories. Oh, remember, probably. this is, you know, she died in like 1941. So she does look a little bit Dutch, German. Yeah. All right, not unattractive. You can see the dental work. Yeah, it's not very good, is it? No, no. Um, too many gobstoppers. I think if I mean I don't imagine that she would have smiled with her teeth out like that when she was alive. She would have been concealing them. <laughs> Probably like that. They found some artifacts on her when oh. she was recovered. I haven't got any room over there. Peach coloured taffeta underskirt, which may actually be a, a misnomer. Put that way, it's freaking me out. When they, uh, when they found, when they pulled the skull out, there was taffeta in the mouth because of where the lads had put it back. So they thought she'd been choked. Ah, uh, but hadn't. She hadn't, no, she just died. It's just Bob and his mates. The brown hair, a dark blue striped knitted woolen cardigan, light blue belt. No. Blue crepe soled shoes, peach coloured skirt, maybe, and a mock wedding ring. Two shillings and sixpence worth. Probably not a watch because it would have slipped off when they cut her hand off, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right. I'm more inclined to believe the last one. It does seem to have more evidence behind it. Um, and it fits more neatly with the whole war mysteries. <laughs> well, that's why we're here, so, isn't it? So, uh, I think we should go for, oh, I'm gonna go for theory number three, please, Bob. Three, theory three. Yeah, we'd get my vote, but it's it's not been proven. Um, it seems to be the most plausible of the three so far. But, you know, unless somebody finds her in a photo album. Stop showing me. <laughs> It's yeah, a mystery. Yeah, so, so it's pretty inconclusive. I wonder what our viewers think. Or indeed, does anybody recognise her? Anyone out there probably going to live in Germany or Holland or Lincolnshire? It was the shit. That's the one. If you know her, get in touch. Mm. Yeah, tell us. We'll make sure the information gets to the relevant authorities, of course. Not telling. Yeah, yeah. Not telling me. <clears throat> anyway, that leaves us with just our legacy. February 2018, a facial reconstruction expert at Liverpool John Moore University completed an approximation of Bella based on surviving images of the skeletal remains. Hopefully in time, this image can be used to help identify the woman. This single image is, however, likely all that remains of her. Her bones having been lost many years ago under unusual circumstances, and those involved in the original investigation, now deceased. Intelligence work was, and of course, still is, one of the most dangerous military assignments. 
espionage agents could expect no mercy if they were discovered and captured, the majority tortured for information before a summary execution, usually an immediate bullet to the head. On rare occasions, they would be held captive for years, such as those interned in the infamous Soviet Gulag system. If indeed Bella herself was a Nazi agent, then she is certainly one of the more unusual cases, in that there are no records available to even suggest her existence as a member of the Abwehr, much less verify it, nor any proof of her entry into Great Britain. One might perhaps surmise that she had parachuted into the West Midlands during the early 1940s, a known method employed by other Abwehr agents, and therefore not an impossibility. The cryptic letter from Una Mossop adds weight to the idea that she was at least casually familiar with the wartime practices in the area, by virtue of her association to Jack Mossop, but the tangible evidence seems to begin and end there. With the loss of her bones, we are left with little to help us identify the woman. Perhaps an original photograph of her will emerge in time, secreted in a long-forgotten photo album, or indeed archived correspondence may be discovered to confirm her link to the German Secret Service. Whatever the case may be, without further information, the true identity of Bella is likely to remain a mystery. So chances are we're never going to find out who she is, um, because most people don't even bother looking through photo albums anymore. They just, you know. Well, it's impossible, isn't it? <clears throat> people have thousands of pictures on their phones. I suppose uh, you know an effort has been made to produce a picture, and she sort of looks Holland-esque, Dutch. So yeah, that's the one. <laughs> or Germanic, or indeed English. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess it's tricky um, to tell, really, isn't it? It is tricky to tell, yeah. She, uh, she could be anybody. In truth, you know, these are just you know, the, even the name Bella. We don't, we don't know for sure that's her. She could be anybody, but she couldn't be Liam Neeson, could she? No, he was too busy on K one twenty nine, wasn't he? Yeah. Which is quite sad because she's just another number on a casualty list at the minute. They, they say she gave birth at least once, judging from the bones. So. There may be descendants out there that are related to her and, and don't even know it. So if you are a daughter or indeed a great, great, great granddaughter or grandson of uh, of Bella, um, let us know. Let us know. <coughs> in the comments below, down there, in the old pit. Right on the bottom. So that's it. That's uh, this episode's mystery. Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, do you reckon she was a sex worker? Do you think she was a Nazi spy? Or do you think she just got drunk? one afternoon with the lads and just got with the wrong lads and basically ended up in a tree. Um, let us know what you think down in our uh, pit of comments that are down there. They're a little bit less dusty than they were last time now, a bit more use. So if you've not subscribed already then do please do consider doing so. Um, series 4 is now up and running so there'll be more episodes on the way. And hit the notification bell. You want me to do a little ding sound when you do that? I know that you're going to. Yeah. So, do you want to do it again now so they know that I know that, you know? There you go. Okay. I think that's probably the first time we've ever actually mentioned that. Let's perhaps not do that again. 
So thank you very much for, for joining us for this episode and we'll see you in the next one. What do you reckon? In a tree. You ever woken up in a tree? I've woken up near trees, but not in one. I've been in one, but I didn't wake up in it. I'm pretty sure I got handcuffed to a tree when I was at uni. You might have done. That's the problem, I don't remember. I don't remember how I got home. There's just traffic cones involved. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Don't yeah. get drunk. Don't get drunk in the middle of winter with two strange blokes, one of which is a trapeze artist. No. Do get drunk, well, just not in the middle of winter with a couple of blokes, one of which is a trapeze artist. Well, I've, got, I've got the red stripe advocate over here. Well, like I said earlier, they didn't have any bud boys at the shop. <laughs> you need to have a word with John. Send Ivan round there, he'll sort them out. No, we just do the weather. <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> Fucking hell, that was loud. God! <laughs> I don't know if I can carry on. All that clapping with that mosquito that was buzzing around in the series three, and you. No, you know, I've blood feel. coming out my ear. What do you mean, I don't know how you feel? I've never deafened you. <laughs> Please, no more of that. I wanted it to be louder. Shit. I wanted it to be louder. Live recording! <laughs> <laughs> you can't be that loud. You can't be that loud. No! <laughs> <laughs> Only a little one. It's not, it was, was not a little one. I was gonna, it was a little crack. You're gonna give me a headache, man. Oh. It was alive, whatever. Ah, oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Fucking hell, man. <laughs> I can't hear. <laughs> cooking, cooking in your suit. <laughs> you can't hear shit. I'm so hot. <laughs> I'm so hot. Take your suit off then. And now it's <laughs> death. You've moved so much earwax, I can't hear anything. <laughs> Look at it all on the end of the pencil. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was fucking horrible. <laughs> Jesus. God, my entire vision went white. <laughs> that could just bring the death lights. No, it's not the <laughs> lights. It's because the nerves in the back of my eyes were stunned <laughs> by the noise. <laughs> I heard it in my other ear as well. God, that was horrible. <laughs> Stun grenade. It was horrible. Ugh. Right, I'm going to take this bloody tar off now. Yeah, right? well, I, I'm. Yeah. I am absolutely cooking.